Frank Delastrito time. And you know what I'll do? We have a new number for Frank tonight. I don't know where he is. Oh, I hate when that happens. Great, it's busy. So, uh, might be busy because I just dialed it twice. All right, we'll try it again. Uh, welcome to Visual Radio. Today is the last, the last Thursday of the year, my God. Do you have plans for New Year's Eve? I never go out on New Year's Eve. We're going out this weekend. We have plans, um, but we'll probably be home early because we just like chilling on New Year's Eve. So if you do go out, drive safely and have fun. I never go to first night. It is amateur night and I do not wanna, well, okay. Uh, we have a problem there. So let's see here. It's tough talking on the air and trying to get a hold of my guest at the same time, but I'm going to do that. So bear with me, people. Here we go. Here we go. I will talk on my cell phone and talk on the air. Visual radio, that was a lot of fun watching that stuff from the expo. And this book is uh, very good. Tony Iommi, Iron Man. And who is there? My director's here, Kevin Russo. Hey, Kevin. Hello. I cannot find my guest. And we were going to... Hey, Frank, I've been trying to call that number. Okay, um, do you want to call me or do you want me to call that number again? Yeah, do you know the number? Our number is 781-721-0137. Sure, thanks. Very strange. It rang on his end. Um, I can see the red light on that one, and this one doesn't have a red light, but I know when the red light's not on to look here. So, you could talk. Um, you can go back and forth. I, I, I can tell with the red light. You're on Visual Radio Live. Yo, this is Frank Delastrito to talk about movies. Hey, Frank, thank you very much for calling in. All right. <laughs> we got two topics tonight. We've got Last of the Mohicans, the 1920 film, hmm? and we have your book. Now, we covered your Dracula book which is... Fair over uh, London, yep. Yep. And then you, you sent me a book years ago, a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Yes. And I'd like to talk about it tonight. Okay. So you want to ask a question? You want me to start talking? <laughs> <laughs> well, is that your first book? No, my first book was Vampire Over London. Okay. Uh, which I researched with uh, my co-author Andy Brooks when I was living in the UK. And while I was doing that, I was writing magazine articles. And in case any authors are out there, let me tell them that if you write a great magazine article, you live for an issue. If you write a book, whether it be great, good, or bad, you live forever. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, had, I had quite a few magazine articles, all on 1930s and 40s horror movies. And I pulled them all together. I rewrote them so they kind of fit together, and then I filled in the gaps with four more articles that I'd never published anywhere, and lo and behold came out my second book, so it's kind of a compendium of magazine articles I had written, but it's, they, were, they were rewritten and I added to them, and that became a quaint and curious volume of Forgotten Lore. And it's a very exciting book. Uh, you're very detailed, Frank. We're honored to have you on here every week because you have great insight and a passion, and uh, it just... It, it flows from the pages, and when people oh. do that, I appreciate it. Well, the, uh, the passion is just, these are the movies I grew up on, 
And well, actually, I grew up with, with these movies, and I grew up with a lot of schlock horror, and I, I don't really get into the schlock of this. I'm talking about the classics here, the universal films of the 1930s and 40s, the RKO films like King Kong, etc. The, the 1930s and 40s was merely, really my, my main thrust. I do get into some 1920s films. I certainly mention 1950s, 60s, and, and later films, but the 30s and 40s is where my first love lies. That's where the passion is, so that's why it's in there. But you like movies other than just horror movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, my, my favorite movie of all time is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. But right up there are uh, The Godfather and uh, Moby Dick. Uh, by, my favorite movie this year was Super 8. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I, 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 I love horror movies, but I go to movies a lot. I just, I just went and saw the new Mission Impossible movie today. And what did you think? It's not bad. The, ac the action is A1. It's a little formulaic, but I, I, I didn't think I'd wasted my two hours. So, uh, two hours and 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I, whatever it is. Did you see it in IMAX? I did not. I, um, I, I prefer to relax a little while I'm watching. I hate it when the movie attacks me, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left it there. We've got all sorts of Mission Impossible posters if you want me to see if I can mail some down. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Why not? You know, uh, we got we got four different ones. Okay, well, okay. Well, you got one for each movie, I guess. No, no. It's uh, there's three different colors. It's the Dubai building. Okay. Oh yeah. I uh, well, I have actually I have friends that work in Dubai, so send it to me, and I'll I'll get it to them. <laughs> I want you to have it for your collection. Your. Uh... Oh, oh yeah. No, no. Well, I, no. I'll, 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 if it's any good, I'll hang on to it. I can send you a couple of the smaller ones. That, that's it. I've got to find those rolls. I've got one at home, you know, that you can mail the posters in. Okay. Uh, They've they got to be readily found because uh, these are nice. These are beautiful. And I go to the screenings, and then they have the posters there for free, you know? Okay. So I'm on the train. I take the train. Uh, going into Boston for these screenings, I like to take the train, take my time, go to dinner, then go home, you know? And uh, did you see it on IMAX, I asked? No, I, I did not. Yeah, so I saw it on like a half of IMAX. Uh, this theater, they couldn't get a permit to build the uh, ceiling even higher, so they, it's like maybe the, a third of an IMAX screen, but they have the IMAX camera or projector. You know? My favorite scene in the movie was the fight in the, uh, the auto plant. With, with, with the, all, the, all the automatic machines are building cars, so no one's there except Tom Cruise and the villain. Which was a pretty cool thing. Yeah, and I, the reason I think I liked it is Tom Cruise got really hurt, because the whole movie, he's, you know, he's doing these incredible things, and it's not a scratch on him, and I'm, I'm saying, come on, give me a break. And then he goes in there, and he, you know, he, he barely comes out alive, he breaks his leg or whatever. And uh, so I appreciated that. I liked the little realism. And the thing for Tom Cruise is, and I wrote this in my review, this franchise is perfect for him because he's taken a battering with his reputation. And his movies haven't been great, but this series he's doing a good job with. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't always agree with his choice of role, but I think uh, if you're going to make, you know, he, he, can, he can be the center of a movie the way a lot of actors can't. And like War of the Worlds, I, I think the, his War of the Worlds film with Steven Spielberg focused too much on him. But he, he did well, but I, if I was there, I said, you know, it's, it's not the war of Tom Cruise, it's the war of the world. It shows a bit more of the world than Tom Cruise, but I think, you know, he, he, he did hold it together, and I'll give him credit for that. You know, that war of the worlds, just like Keanu Reeves in that other remake uh, from the 50s. Uh, uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. Thank you. Both movies I, ha I felt very good about until they were over, and they're not repeatables. Like Super 8, you can watch again. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, well, we're, you know, really, there's a there's a Cold War nuclear holocaust <laughs> flavor to both of those films, and now that the Cold War is over, and you know, maybe terrorists will be dropping bombs on us, but I don't think any countries will in the foreseeable future. They kind of had they're kind of out of theme, so they were they were. But they were caught a bit off balance there. So I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I enjoyed both of those movies. I could watch the first day The Earth Stood Still again. I probably wouldn't watch the Keanu Reeves one again. And the same with The War of the Worlds. Do you know my favorite part of the Keanu Reeves movie 
was when he was with that professor in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were talking very heady and real scientific stream of consciousness stuff. And I really dug it. And then that kid goes and calls, you know, the police. And that just ruined it. I thought that that character should have been in the movie a lot longer. Uh, that just, for me, it really got things moving in a very good psychological way. Yeah, and then and the same thing happened in the first movie when the uh, when Michael Reddy goes to talk to uh, the 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 Albert Einstein type scientist, and uh, but uh, yeah, that was that held together better. But again, I think it was it was more suited to its time. Yeah, yeah. Now Super Eight, um, I had a problem with where I thought it was almost a perfect movie, and then it veers off into a quasi. Um, um, Oh, what's that Spielberg movie, uh, First Encounters, Close Encounters of the First Kind, you know, in, into the kiddie land, you know, the amusement park, and I'm sorry, you know what I mean, they're, they're directing it to the kids, they want the kids and the moms and the dads to go to the movies together, and I thought it was a terrific science fiction movie until it started unraveling a bit. Yeah, the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing with, I, I, I probably have a higher opinion of it than you do, but I, I thought near the end when they, when they went down into the uh, alien's lair, I didn't think that held together all that well. That's what I mean. Yeah, but up until then, I, I, I thought when, as a, as a uh, story of coming of age, kids in their early teens, you know, I, I thought, that, I thought it, was, it was tremendous when it was doing that. The ending was a bit of a letdown. Now, he could go back to that and redo it, because that ending, going into an alien's lair, the way they did in uh, uh, Invaders from Mars, the original, uh -huh. that was creepy. Had he just taken that element and stayed real creepy with that, the lair of the alien, um, and if it had a more, uh, less preposterous ending, I think it would have been a fantastic movie. Again, I, I have a higher opinion of it than you, but yes, the... the the last fifth of it wasn't worthy of the first four fifths of it. Well, the train wreck was magnificent. Oh yeah, I uh, yeah I would have liked to be I I couldn't I couldn't see the the driver of the of the truck surviving that. So uh, when, when he did, I was saying I, I said, oh come on, but I forgave him that. He did his best, Danny Glover from uh, Predator Two, I guess. Yeah. That's you know, uh, or even from. Uh, some of the other, um, uh, my Blueheimers is kicking in. I, I used to have this stuff at the tip of my tongue, you know, but that's okay. We're also talking about your book, Quaint and Curious Volume of Forgotten Lore. So you must have written a lot of articles since the book. No, I really gave up articles after that because I, I started one book I act, uh, after that. And I finished it, but I decided no one would ever read it, so I just put it aside, and I've been working on a third book since then. So there's actually a fourth in there, too. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, there's a, four, there's a third that'll never see the light of day, so the fourth is actually the third. And what's the third one called? Uh, it's called I Saw What I Saw When I Saw It, growing up in the 1950s and 60s with television reruns, old movies, and not much else. I like that. Why didn't you, man, you know, I don't know. That's the one, that's the one I'm finishing. I mean, that's the one I'm going to publish. That's the, that's the oh. official third book, although it's actually the fourth book. Okay, but the third, you don't want to tell us the title of the shelved book. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, it doesn't really have a title. Um, the, uh, the 19, United States takes the census every 10 years, right? Yep. Those census records are secret for 72 years. Are they really? Then, then they become public. So uh, the 1930 census became public information in 2002. And where is the highest concentration of famous people in the world that people today would have heard of? And that is in Los Angeles because of the movie industry. I was going to say Connecticut. If, well, it may, maybe, maybe up in your neck of the woods, that's true. <laughs> no, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty firmly... Uh, Hollywood. You know, the closer you get to Hollywood, the more you start seeing names. You know, like, and you'll go through the census, and uh, on one page there'll be Charles, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Harold Lloyd. We're all living on this close enough that they're on the same page of the census. And uh, 
so I went through, I, uh, I took years, went through the census records page by page for Los Angeles, and I, I forget, that was like 56 rolls of microfilm, and each roll of microfilm has thousands of pages. And wow. uh, I mean, I use this as electronic search engines where you can do that, but the search engines are depend on the handwriting of the people that did it, and they get they get spellings wrong and all that. So I did a lot of that, but then I went through them page by page, and I was writing a book about that, and it was an exciting adventure. I learned a lot, but when it was all done, I looked at the book and said, "This is nothing but a glorified phone book. I don't think anybody's going to buy it, so I just put it aside." Oh, I think you could expand on it, though. I, I someday I may, but this this the. Book number four, which is actually book number three, uh, I saw what I saw when I saw it, which, by the way, is not only a quote from uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, it is repeated throughout there. Every time, you know, Costello, is, as you might guess, sees the monsters before anybody else. He keeps trying to convince them, and every time Abbott tells him he's crazy, he says, well, I saw what I saw when I saw it. He says it about, about three or four times in the movie, and then Abbott finally say, uh, says it, and he says that to none other than Lon, Lon Chaney Jr., so, uh, so that's, that's why I took that as a title. Now, I might make a phone call when I get home to uh, James Miller. James Miller is a writer who wrote for my magazine, Varulven. So on the DVD of Abbott and Costello Meets Frankenstein, the person giving the liner notes, if you will, uh, mentions James Miller uh, because Jim interviewed Alona Massey for my fanzine. All right. Did I send you that issue? You did not. Uh, now, Alona Massey passed away, what, 15 years ago? So he interviewed her in 1972, oh, okay. 73. Okay, so he got her, he got her, okay, he got her just as her career was ending. Now, Black he's been quoted in two magazines. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry, two books. Mm -hmm. One was It's Alive, which I can't find anymore. It's a very rare book. Okay. Uh, and now there's a new one because I, I searched it. And there it is. So, you know, what did I do? 500 copies of my fanzine, you know? Mm -hmm. It amazes me that these things get out and it's referenced in your favorite movie, in the DVD version. Well, there you go. <laughs> they don't mention the magazine. They mention Jim Miller. Okay. But I, I just think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that uh, fanzines were the blogs of the old days. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons I don't write articles so much anymore is that the fanzines kind of passed from the scene starting uh actually 9-11 crippled the uh 9-11 then the anthrax scare crippled a lot of mail order stuff and a lot of a lot of things that d lived by mail orders magazines among them were hanging on there by their fingernails anyway because the economy was going down and that gave them the death blow so like a some of the, there's a handful of magazines left, but there were a lot more in the 1990s than there are now. Well, Cine Fantastique has done very well. Yeah. yeah I mean, th I mean, again, there's a couple that have, that have but the, the kind that would publish the articles I write kind of went, went by the wayside. There's not many anymore. Uh, there's, a, there's a magazine called Monster Bash, which is tied to the Monster Bash conference, and I write lighthearted articles for them. They called me a couple of months, uh, a few months ago, and asked me to write a light hearted article on Island of the Lost Souls, which is one of the most, you know, gruesome horror movies of the 1930s. But <laughs> I managed to write one basically telling how scared I was when I was a kid in the park, because that's the only one that ever scared me. I, I love the old horror movies, but they never scared me. I loved them I loved them from the day I saw them. And then one Saturday I turned on the TV and there was uh, Island of the Lost Souls and uh, it was it was quite a ride and I was I was glad when it was over. Well you know the old Tower Records had a lot of fanzines in the stores. Mostly rock and roll. There's an Elton John fanzine. Uh, there was a Supremes fanzine, and there is one on Dylan, Blood on the Tracks, mm -hmm. which a friend of mine, one of my editors at Media Line, he wrote. He writes for fanzines, even though he he you know is an editor, um, and he has a book out uh, about a TV show from England. Walford State of Mind is the book. And he writes this East Enders fanzine. So he publishes a fanzine to this day. There are still people that seek them out and want them. Yeah, they are around. They're not what they were. I mean, right. the golden age of them has passed, but they are still around. And they will be around for a while. They will, they'll be around until at least my generation passes from the scene, because I think we're the, uh, we're, we were the chief consumers of them, that, that 
that's got to get handed over to the younger generation if they're going to survive. Well, I bet 100 years from now, the kids are going to find it very exciting to publish their own fanzine when uh, paper and printing is obsolete. It'll be uh, an anachronism that's fun. That's true. Uh, it's getting so easy to publish now that there's so much published, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't, you can find it, but, you, you know, there's so much, if you, put it, you do a search engine, you know, 10,000 things come up, and you say, well, which one should I read? Because I can't read them all. I can't even read a fraction of them. We've got 10 minutes left, Frank. If you want, you can, you can decide how much you want to spend on Quaint and Curious Volume and on Last of the Mohicans. Okay, I'll, I'll spend a little time on Quaint and Curious Volume, but I hope someday you'll call and we'll talk about that for a bit longer. Okay. I'd love to talk about it. Uh, the, the, um, my generation, John, born in 1950. My folklore is basically Disney animated features, Pinocchio, Snow White, and the Seven Dwarfs. That was my fairy tales, right? And okay. About the, time that, about the time that the baby boomers grew out of that, bang, comes on television, the old Universal horror movies in the late 50s, shock theater came on in 1957, Dracula, Bela, Bela Lugosi's Dracula uh, television premiere was on uh, Oct uh, October 3rd, 1957. So for, the, for the, the baby, for a lot of baby boomers, they transited right from Disney to Universal. They went from Mickey Mouse and uh, Peter Pan to Dracula and Frankenstein almost overnight because that's, they were outgrowing one and the other one was there waiting for them. And, I, and to us, the kids of my age, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, they weren't characters in movies. These were, these were figures of legend. And what I try and do with the book is uh, go into some depth into the characters and, and how they evolve. Like there's, there's, there's basically two kinds of monsters when you think of it in filmic terms. There's the ones that never have sequels, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the Phantom of the Opera, uh, there's no such thing as the son of the Phantom. There, there is a son of Dr. Jekyll, but that's kind of a, you know, it's not really a sequel. It's just somebody snuck that title in there. And then there's the, the characters like Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman in particular, who if you follow them through the 30s and 40s, Wolfman's old in the 40s, uh, they, they, are, they have a long mythology. You know, they have, you know, a number of adventures, if you want to call that, or, or, or whatever. And from that, you know, you see different... And, and nobody thought in this terms, these terms because these movies, quite frankly, were made to get money. They would make their money on first release, and no one thought about them much after that. But they, they, they you know, so you can say, well, they're repeating the same plot over again. Yeah, but I might come along and say they're, they're looking at the same themes again and again, always with a little twist, always a little difference, and each time you learn something new about the character. And uh, it's surprising if you watch the, like the, the Karis Mummy movies, the four mo mo uh, movies with the mummy in it, and I try to say that fast three times. Uh, Karis, you know, even though he's all wrapped up, he can't talk. The poor guy, all he can do is drag his leg. He's got one arm that doesn't work. If you watch the movies, he actually develops as a character. He becomes rebellious in that movie. He finally gets united with his lost love, things like that. So I, I try to follow them as... as uh, uh, I wrote this as a book, as, as one might write a book on Greek mythology, following the characters through, always throwing in as much background as I could discover that was new on the movies. Because I always think, you know, if I expect a reader to, write, to, uh, to read my opinion, I owe him some new information that isn't anywhere else. I was always trying to dig up more, or come up with some, some new approach, so it would say, okay, you know, I, maybe I agree with his opinions, maybe I don't, but I did learn something from this. And I, that's what I did in, in those articles. All, all of them were for Cult Movies uh, magazine, which is gone now. And then I filled in the, the four more. And uh, so I was, I was I passed in this off and say, this is the, the subtitle of the book is The Mythology and History of Classic Horror Movies, which I, you know, if I was going to be a bit more explicit, the mythology and history of 1930s and 40s classic American horror movies, because that's really, really what my, my bounds are. What I'd like to do is I'd like to evaluate all what you've just said because it fascinates me. And I got two questions, and then we should move on to um, Last of the Mohicans. Uh, the questions are, Cult Movies Magazine, you wrote for them. Uh, who edited and published that? Uh, the editor, and the editor was Mike Kopner. The publisher was uh, Buddy Barnett. And what I liked about them is I could, if I wrote a 20-page, you know, my, my chapters are 20, 25 pages long. If I wrote 
I sent that to a magazine, they would either ignore it or send it back and say it's too long, cut it down, and I'd say, well, you know, not not really interested in that. These guys would publish what I sent them. Uh, I wish to, I wish they sometimes did a better job editing it because they really didn't. They, they, you know, whatever mistakes were in there were mine, except occasionally they left out a paragraph. I know how that is, but you know, uh, it's just you know, you, you gotta just be thankful for what you got, you know. Oh no, I was I was very thankful. Oh no, no, I have, I know I know that, and I'm just yeah. You know, you're you know, it, it's amazing stuff. So, Cult Movies Press is your company. Yeah, well, I, I was kind of allied with them, and. Uh, and since I was only known to the movie people through Cult Movies magazine, I named the I named the publishing company that my wife and I set up, Cult Movies Press, with the blessings of Cult Movies magazine. And uh, now Cult Movies magazine is gone. And every now and then I get a call from somebody say, "Hey, the magazines uh, went out of business, and I had three issues coming. Where's my money?" <laughs> Write them back and say, uh, "You got the wrong boy. I'm, this is Cult Movies Press, not Cult Movies magazine." That's funny. Yeah. Now. Let us get to the last of the Mohicans, the 1920 film, and we'll go back to your book another time. Okay. Last of the Mohicans, 1920. So, of course, it's silent. It was, uh, it was made by uh, Maurice Tournier, a, a French director who made uh, a bit of a name for himself in France and came to America and made a bigger name for himself, but never quite... When the, when the industry all concentrated on Hollywood, he went there, but he never quite made it there, so he went back to France, and that's where he finished his career. This movie was filmed on the East Coast, but might actually have been filmed in the actual places where uh, uh, Last of the Mohegans, the novel, takes place, which was uh, upstate New York. And uh, I know I don't have much time. Uh, Wallace Beery is the only name that... Uh, most most people have heard of, and he is the he is the villainous Indian, and he, he makes a very good Indian, and he, and this was before he got that beer belly, so he is a he's a real alpha male. Don't mess with me. <laughs> In, I, I'm sorry if I'm saying the Indian Native American, but everyone knows what we mean. And uh, and one thing I got to point out there's a if you watch the movie closely, you might catch a glimpse of Boris Karloff, who has an uncredited part as an, as a Native American. That's wild. Okay. About the same time, in Germany, there's a, there's a version of Last of the Mohegans being made with Beta Lugosi playing a, a Native American. He has a much larger role. He's a, he's, a, he's, he's a star of the movie, and a German silent movie. Oh, so both and, have survived, right? Uh, I don't think that's survived. Oh. Uh, I've, I've seen There's lots of stills of it, but I've never seen it. I don't think it has survived. And then to the, the follow the story, 35 years later... When the Last of the Mohegans television show starts, the uh, the the lead role, uh, one of the lead roles, is uh, the lead Native American of it, is played by Lon Chaney Jr. <laughs> so, so uh, that's a great parallel for uh, horror movie fans. Yeah, Last of the Mohegans has a Native American played by Boris Karloff in one version, a Native American played by. Beta Lugosi in another version, and the Native American played by Lon Chaney Jr. in the TV series. It says on Wikipedia, Boris Karloff, who later found fame as a horror film star, had an uncredited role as a marauding Indian. Yes, and, you, and uh, to be honest, I, I, uh, you know, I, I only found out that this was the movie you're going to show this afternoon, so I watched some of it, and I was particularly looking for every, whenever I saw a marauding Indian <laughs> or a marauding Native American. And I couldn't, I couldn't pick him out. So I imagine he's, uh, that can be done, but I just didn't have time to find him or I would, you know, it's kind of like trying to spot Hitchcock in some of these movies. You can do right. it or you can't. Kaloff can be seen 50 minutes into the film throwing a baby into the air. Okay, well, if I, I didn't read that. I wish I had known that. I would have narrowed it down. But I, and how many marauding Indians can be there? Be, be Throwing babies into the, the air. Throwing babies in the air. In 1920, of all places. This movie's been recorded like 1911, 1920, 1932, 36, 77, 92, and a miniseries in 71. Yeah, well, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis was in the 1992 version, which I... I'm trying to remember, as I recall, it was exceptionally violent compared to the other ones, but it was probably closer to the real thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, James Fenimore Cooper, as, a, as an author, is people know his name, but he's probably not read very much. But Last of the Mohegans, I would say, turn of the century, if you, you couldn't call yourself an educated American if you hadn't read Last of the Mohegans. And he died 60 years before it was put to film. Uh, I, think, I think the I think the movie came I think the book came out like in the early 
1820s. So, I mean, it's, it's around the long, he was, you know, he yeah. wrote a long time ago. He died in 1851. The book came out around the 20s, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, there's one author who didn't have a chance to say how, how the film screwed up his work, but that's... Uh, <laughs> I think he would be very um, pleased to see all the uh, adaptions and realize what a, what a mark he made. No, if I come back 60 years after my death and anyone's read anything I've written, I'll be, I'll be, as, I'll be as happy as can be. Well, that's our show tonight, Frank. Happy New Year, man. Okay, we'll talk about